My name is Shanae. For those of you whom I don't know, you're also welcome to change your seat if you want to be able to see me, but you don't have to. Um, I'm one of the assistant teachers here, and I lived for many years at a monastery near here. Well, it's about three hours from here. It's about 60 miles outside of Portland towards the coast. Um, my husband, Soten, who leads the morning meditations here, and um, who's also a Zen priest and who's also an assistant teacher here, him and I like to do a lot of long distance walking, and he likes to do long distance running, which I tried for a while, but have recently um, just stopped doing. <laughs> Standing. It takes a lot of time. So he does these long hundred mile races where he'll go for a hundred miles in one go. So like 24 hours. It's like a session, like a Zen meditation retreat in one. <laughs> you know, you just keep going and all the mind states come up and all, you know, of course, all the resistance and the tiredness and the joy and the exhilaration and all that you just, the pain, the the you know finding that depth of something that keeps you going and falling asleep even while running <laughs> he talks about <laughs> um, through the mountains where there's wild animals you know you can imagine so but we inspired by him when we left the monastery and also you know together i wanted to travel um, I had always wanted to travel since I was young, and somehow I had gotten into, um, you know, I'd just been very drawn to this practice when I met my first teacher, and so I gave up all my travel plans in order to really give myself to now, to the inner travel, right? And, but then when it was time for us to leave, after many years of that inner travel, I still had the desire to outwardly travel. And he wanted to do something challenging, you know, something that would really push him in that way. So he said, how about we run to the tip of South America? <laughs> we both had been learning Spanish when we were younger. And so we had this affinity with Latin culture and still do. Um, so I said, OK, you know, the kind of like personality that this is, it says, OK, let's try. And um, that, that soon shifted into let's walk, <laughs> which he sort of compromised, <laughs> which is what we do when we have a partner or when we have a friend, you know. One thing I wanna talk about today is spiritual friendship. And the other thing is simplicity, simplicity. And I bring up this walking thing because um that was one of the qualities that we were wanting to embody in this trip was this simplicity and it is one of the qualities that we embody when we decide just to do one thing whether it's just one thing from a long long time like that like walk every day all day or in in meditation retreat we sit all day every day or one thing at a time Right, this is what our practice of presence calls us to, is this simplicity of really being with what it is that we're doing. So right now here, we're all listening to this, these words. <clears throat> Usually we're listening to the words and we're walking and we're cooking, you know, and we're doing our to-do list, you know. So our culture at, as a whole doesn't really support this simplicity anymore. So for most of us we really have to make an intention to be simple mm -hmm. we are doing a walking a 60 mile walking pilgrimage with this sangha this june if you want to join there are limited spots we're walking from from corvallis to the coast and yesterday i did a walk with um, some friends. So one of the, we did a 200 mile practice walk through the wilderness of Oregon last, uh, last summer, last July, August. And our friend who we lived with at the monastery joined us for that for 
uh, three weeks of walking, two weeks of walking. And he had the idea that he wanted to walk through Portland from one side of Portland to the other. So if you know Portland from Mount Tabor to Forest Park, so it's 10 miles. It's very doable in a day. You can have quite a spacious day just walking at a normal pace. So I said, I'll do it with you. And um, four other people said, I'll do it with you. Well, one other, three of us did the whole walk and three more did the half, half of the walk. So that was yesterday. And during that walk, <clears throat> these two themes emerged, this simplicity and the spiritual friendship. So I'll talk about simplicity first. I was just struck by how beautiful it was, how relieving it was just to have one thing to do all day, you know, like on my to do list for Saturday was walk. <laughs> you know, and, and he made this beautiful schedule for us where we sat for the sunrise at Mount Tabor for an hour. And then we walked to we walked one mile to a friend's house for breakfast and we did a little chanting service and breakfast. And then we walked three miles to, to Pioneer Square. And then we sat in Pioneer Square right in the middle, which was a really interesting. Uh, we debated. I was like, should we sit at the waterfront? You know, it's a little more out of the way. It's kind of a statement to sit in the middle of a square, but it was really it was really beautiful. If you've never set Zazen in a public space, I yeah. recommend trying it both as an offering for other people to just see like somebody sitting still. My first teacher, Satya, who was one of the people who joined us for the first part of the day yesterday and whose house we had breakfast at, he would talk about the first time he ever set Zazen <clears throat> and he was in college and he sat like five minutes and he was just struck by the fact that like you can actually do this like, <laughs> just not do anything for five minutes for you know five hours even you know the first time i heard of somebody meditating for five hours like what five? you cannot meditate for five hours but lo and behold <laughs> We have Zen Sashin, where we sit for eight hours a day. It's a very, very profound practice. So then we got to Pioneer Square and we sat and we afterwards we had a little discussion and talked about, you know, what came up in that just simplicity of sitting. And all the little fear, somebody might grab my bag, you know, some guy walked by and started yelling things at us. <laughs> um, and you know being you know watched that's a really interesting place of practice and then we walked another three miles and so we walked something like that maybe four miles and that we went into forest park so for the we got into the woods and then we sat again at piddock mansion if you know this uh, mansion that overlooks portland for an hour to end the day and at the end of the day, I just felt so nourished by the simplicity of it, by the, it's a pure, it's very purifying to do one thing. It's also very purifying to exercise the body, to walk. And this is something that we've, a lot of us have lost in our world where we just get into the car and drive everywhere. <clears throat> I like to give homework assignments sometimes during my Dharma talks. So I'll give you a homework assignment if you want to take it up. <clears throat> and this is the assignment of going for a long walk. You could do a whole day, you could do half a day. And without a very, without a very clear plan of where you're going, so for instance, yesterday, we didn't know what our route would be. We knew we were gonna to go to this place, but we didn't really know what our route would be. 
And there were these moments where we're like, should we go right? Should we go left? Is there going to be a bridge there? Because we had to cross the river. And we just, we didn't know. We might have to walk a little more. So it wasn't, we weren't, uh, you know, obsessed with efficiency as we often are. It was more about the journey and not knowing. So a walk of not knowing is the homework assignment. You know, and just bring whatever necessities you need. So I brought some money so I could buy food. I brought a water bottle. I brought my rain gear, my umbrella. So I had everything I needed and I didn't bring my phone. So that's the other part of the assignment is don't bring your phone or anything or reading, you know, just to be, to be observing, just, just to be in the simplicity of the moment. So zazen is simplicity. That's what we're doing when we come here. We're just we're being simple, utterly simple. We're putting aside our complicated past and future thinking or figuring out mind. And of course, that is habitual, and so it arises. But as we continue this practice of simplicity, it arises less <clears throat> sometimes. <laughs> it's a it's a it's an ancient habit. So we have to be patient. But it also arises lighter. It's lighter. We can we notice it faster. And although the thoughts come, they don't grab us as much, and we can we can return to this zero point. It's a really beautiful practice, just zero. See how long you can stay there, here. You know, okay. And just like anything, as we practice, it expands that capacity. And it's satisfying. That's why we do it, right? We do it not because it's the right thing to do, but because actually this simplicity of now is the only place where we can find peace. So this is renunciation. Satyam, uh, used, Satya is my first teacher. He would talk about joyful renunciation. So it's not renunciation out of discipline. It's renunciation because it's joyful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit um, so from the Pali Canon. And I just want to say what the Pali Canon is because I know a lot of people don't know that phrase. So in Buddhist, what do you call it? Um, in the field of Buddhism, <laughs> there are three main, um, we call them vehicles, sort of views of practice. There's the Theravadan view, which is most in line with the, uh, what are thought to be the original uh, teachings of the historical Buddha, the person who founded the Buddhist religion. Uh, who lived 2,500 years ago in India. Then there's the Mahayana, which is what Zen fits into. And there's the Vajrayana, which we usually associate with, ter with Tibetan Buddhism. And so people have written books on these three vehicles. So I'm just gonna say that for now, that's enough. Um, but the Pali Canon is the, the collection of what's considered the original teachings of the Buddha, which were passed down orally for 500 years and then were written down. And um, there's some really great websites, if you're interested, you can ask me sometime where you can look up, like, what did the Buddha say about renunciation? What did the Buddha say about um, meditation? What did the Buddha say about simplicity? And you can see these uh, sutras that were supposedly spoken by him. Of course, it was a long time ago, so we don't really know for sure how, you know, 
like I'm giving this talk today in 2,500 years. You guys pass it down for 500 years orally, <laughs> and then you write it down, right? So, okay. <laughs> but here's what he said about abandoning the unskillful, so renunciation and cultivating the skillful. Don't go by reports, don't go by legends, by traditions, by scripture. Don't go by logical conjecture, by inference, by analogies. Don't go by agreement through pondering views or by probability or by thought. This contemplative is our teacher. When you know for yourselves that these qualities are unskillful. These qualities are blameworthy. These qualities, when adopted and carried out, lead to harm and to suffering. Then you should abandon them. Then you should renounce them. When you know for yourself that these qualities are skillful, that these qualities are blameless, that these qualities, when adopted and carried out, lead to welfare and to happiness, then you should enter and remain in them. <clears throat> so simplicity, renunciation. What qualities do we want to renounce? You can think for yourself in your life. What qualities, what actions, what habits of mind, what habits of body can be released or do you want to release? And which ones do you want to make room for? So when we simplify, when we renounce what I'm talking about, this complicated way of being, whatever it is you feel is not leading you towards peace, towards happiness, towards well-being, is not leading others in your life towards happiness, towards peace, towards well-being. We have this choice that we can make. And it's not always so easy, like we can say, yes, I'm going to renounce it, and we do, right? <laughs> right? We try that a lot. I'm going to do it, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> for one, this is why we have Zazen, so that we can really take the time to investigate and to really know for ourselves the suffering that these habit patterns that these ways of thinking, that these ways of acting are um, what their results are, how they feel in the body, and so that then we, we want to renounce them. And this is why we have Sangha. And this is why we have the tools of meditation. So we have to be responsible for finding what it is that's going to help us to renounce what it is that's going to help us to cultivate the qualities that are skillful and renounce the qualities that are unskillful. And one of those things, I'm going to go into my second topic here that really came up in this walk yesterday, is spiritual friendship. So here we are amidst spiritual friends. And because they all showed up tonight, we were able to sit for a whole half an hour. <laughs> and we were able to listen to the Dharma talk with full attention. Right? How often do you just sit and listen to a half an hour talk with full attention? So this is the, the Sangha support. <clears throat> um, 
I'm going to read, let's see, where is it? Yeah, this is it. You were at Thursday night Sansan, which is another really wonderful offering where Mushin shares her wisdom with us and we can offer her any question and she'll respond. We sit in the group, a circle, and um, do that every Thursday night. And she mentioned this um, very briefly, but I'm going to read the whole um, sutra from the Pali Canon. It's, it's only four paragraphs. <clears throat> About spiritual friendship. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One, that's the Buddha, was dwelling amongst the Sakyans, where there was a town in the Sa of the Sakyans named Nag Nagaraka. Then the venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One, sat down to one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, this is half the holy life. This, that is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. Isn't this sweet? So he comes up to his teacher, who's also his friend, who's also his cousin, actually. Um, and he's been, he's his attendant, and he's been like living alongside of him, sitting next to him in Zazen, walking with him, getting food, eating with him. He walks up and says, isn't this great? <laughs> this friendship, this is half the spiritual path. This is how I felt yesterday with the people. So when we were walking, we didn't hold silence. We talked and we talked about our fears and we talked about um, renunciation. We talked about giving our life to the Dharma and our vows. We talked about how like, this is it, you know, the teaching of just like, this is it, this is, this life and we appreciated all the blooming flowers. And so this is spiritual friendship, two people who have decided to renounce the unskillful and are still, or three, we were three people, right, at that time. And we're still making mistakes. We're still feeling self-conscious and afraid and getting lost in our thoughts and, but we have this shared orientation towards truth, towards beauty, towards discovering what will lead us to greater freedom. We're talking about our emotions and, and then we're just walking in silence and giving each other space. You know, because most people in our society, they don't they forgot how to do that, to just fall into silence and not have to fill that silence. So we can give that to each other. So he says, no, Ananda, no, this is not so. This is not the entire holy. This, this, this is not half the spiritual path. This is the entire holy spiritual life, Ananda. That is good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. When a bhikkhu has a good friend, a good companion, a bhikkhu is another name for a monk, so they were monks. Huh? When a practitioner has a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, it is to be expected that they will develop and cultivate the path to freedom, the Noble Eightfold Path. I'm gonna skip down here. He, in these sutras, they often repeat the same thing over and over, which is, is how they passed it down orally so that they could remember. So they say the same thing again and again. <clears throat> and he also says, by the following method to Ananda, that it may be understood how the entire holy life is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. By relying upon me as a good friend, Ananda, beings subject, being subject to birth are freed from birth. Being subject to aging are freed from aging. Being subject to death are freed from death. And being subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair are freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. So here he's saying something a little different. He's saying, so in the path of awakening, you can say, of course, we all fall in both and in neither. 
but you can say there are people who are seekers and there are people who are finders. So the Buddha was a seeker for a long time. And you can say that about ourselves too. There's moments where we're seekers and there's moments where we're finders. We've discovered peace. And we can feel that in our body and we can feel that in somebody else's body, in their field of being, when someone is at peace or when an animal is at peace. And so he's saying here in the last part that by being friends, by being around, by associating with beings who have found release from suffering. And so after a lot of seeking, the Buddha, and this happens to all of us at different times, found this great peace. And all this seeking fell away. It's like the great big breath. Ah. Oh. Ah. I have a friend who calls it the great ah. (laughs) Great ah. Oh, this was what I longed for the whole time. It was right. It was this. This breathing. This awareness. So also by associating with these beings of peace, this is the entirety of the spiritual path. And you know, these these beings are not just taking human form. They are taking plant form. They are taking mat form. I mean, look at how at peace this mat is. Some of you heard me talk about Tongan Roshi, who had the vow to become like a chair. (laughs) He was so inspired by a chair that just was totally at ease. It didn't need anything from anyone. And he was always just there to serve whenever anyone needed it. And it didn't, it didn't ask for anything in response, right? This total giving and this total relaxation. So sentient and non-sentient beings expound this peace. And so we can be open to this spiritual friendship, the spiritual communion. Okay, I think that's a wrap. (laughs) Thank you.